working drummer. Now kick it. This is the Working Drummer Podcast, serving up perspectives, experiences, and stories from ground-level working pros. Advice, tips, and secrets on how to build a career in the music business. Hey there, Working Drummers. Welcome to the Working Drummer Podcast. Zach Albetta here with you. My interview today is with Michael Duffy. He is a drummer and Afro-Cuban percussionist who's been based in L.A. for 15 years. In that time, he's toured and recorded with a long list of acts from salsa to Afrobeat to funk to New Orleans Brass Band, uh, most notably the great band Ozo Motley. Before that, he attended North Texas and lived in Austin for a while where he got into session work and the blues scene there and also spent a year in New York for a crash course in Afro-Cuban music. He is currently part of two very cool projects in L.A., a 10-piece Afrobeat slash funk slash dance outfit called Jungle Fire and a B3 organ trio called The White Blinds. This episode is sponsored by Sakai Drums. You know the Sakai sound, now get to know the Sakai name. Trusted around the world for almost 100 years, Sakai's devotion to craftsmanship and passion in creating the world's best quality drums is unmatched. Handcrafted in Osaka, Japan, Sakai offers the most versatile drums from the Trilogy Vintage Series to the modern almighty Japanese Birch recording kit, each boasting a distinct sound and feel. Go to SakaiDrums.com to learn why studio legend Eddie Bayers, the Smashing Pumpkins' Jimmy Chamberlain, and Tedeschi Trucks Band's J.J. Johnson and Tyler Greenwell choose Sakai. Elevate your sound with Sakai. That website, again, is S-A-K-A-E-Drums.com. So Michael Duffy is a veteran of so many scenes and institutions of drumming. Uh, Drum Corps, North Texas, Austin, New York, and L.A., he really immersed himself in each one of those things over the years, and it was really cool to hear what he came away with from each one. So here we go. Enjoy. You and I only met in person like once or twice uh, during my time in L.A., but as I was kind of researching your your background for this interview, I, I found that our paths kind of crossed uh, in, a, in a couple of different ways in years past before, and the first one was that you marched Blue Knights. Actually, I marked Blue Devils. That was a misprint. Okay, okay. I'm, I was uh, the timpanist for Blue Knights in, in 99, but so Blue Devils yeah. is where you were at. What, what year or years uh, did you do that? So I did 91 and 92. Okay. Um, I've talked to a, a couple people uh, who were involved in, in core uh, in one way or another, but, but um, never anyone, I don't think, who was in, in multiple years and certainly not anyone who was in one of the premier cores like, like Blue Devils. Um, so what, uh, what did you take away from that experience? Oh, man, it was incredible um, because I, I mean, I started marching drum corps right out of high school. Wow. So, so I, I marched the Velvet Knights for two years. Velvet was, Knights, that's what it yeah. was. Okay. Yeah, the Velvet Knights is, is a core that's now defunct, but it was like uh, it was an interesting core in Southern California in Orange County. Yeah, they and, were like they were like the Weird Al Yankovic core, weren't they? Just kind of yeah. like the, the jokesters and the. Yeah, it was a bit of comedy, uh, but the drum line was really good. The two years I was in it, especially the first year I was in it, was really good. Yeah. Uh, and the second year, I, I was in the pit my first year, and mm-hmm. uh, and then I played snare my second year. And I, I think, uh, like anything, you know, you're you're touring around and you're seeing the top tier drum lines, and obviously right. Blue Devils has always been one of those uh, forever. Right. Uh, so. I just I I just decided I was going to do it and and I didn't play snare I played quads I really wanted to play quads it, their quad line was one of the best at that you played, time you played quads in the Blue Devils lines yeah for Dude, two years that is that is some shit <laughs> <laughs> it was tough it wasn't easy you know yeah. I I showed up in '91 and there was not a spot for me mm-hmm. and I stuck around and I was not going to go back home to Southern California I was like this is what I want to do. Yeah. And a guy dropped out. Wow! And I and, I, and, and my uh, section leader at the time, his name is Queon Murphy, uh, basically said, "Pick me up every day after work for three months straight." And we drummed uh, for about five hours every night, every day after his job. Wow! Until I got my until I got it, you know, together. And and I, I owe him a giant debt because you know, I mean, he pretty much opened so many doors for me personally. Because from Blue Devils is how I got to North Texas. Okay. 
Cool. Uh, because, you know, not only Paul Rennick, who is uh, a professor at North Texas, was also running the line at Blue Doubles my first year. Okay. And so I made a connection with him, and Quion went to North Texas after he left the Corps in 91. So it just kind of like things kind of progressed from there. And up until up until that point, had did, did you have designs on, on going to music school at all, let alone a prestigious program like North Texas? No, no. That was never, ever in the cards for me. I, I think I was a singular focused young man at that point. <laughs> I just wanted to march Blue Devils. <laughs> and uh, I mean, you know, even when I was younger and I got into drumming, it, it just kind of one thing kind of open the next door you know like yeah. i got in i got into marching band in high school uh, i was in a really good marching band i had a really great instructor by the name of perry hall who was kind of like a legendary uh drumline instructor in southern california and he kind of opened that door for me um he took me to see the blue doubles in 1986 mm -hmm. before i got into my freshman year of high school and that kind of blew my mind yeah and that kind of set me on path for probably wanting to go there, you know, yeah. initially. Yeah. And, uh, and so that was the goal. That was the goal. It was like, I want to do that. And so once I got out of high school, I went and did that. Mm -hmm. And once that ends, you know, at 21, um, and mine ended at 20 cause how my birthday f falls oh, okay. you know, yeah. uh, in the summer. So I saw a lot of people just not sure what they were going to do with their life. You know, and, and I just basically came home from that last run in 1992 with the Blue Devils and got a call from Dr. Shatroma and wow. said, hey, uh, it scouted me basically like an athlete. Yeah. You know, we have a we have a championship drum line out here and I want you to be a part of it. And I told him, I said, well, I've never taken an ACT or an SAT or any sort of anything. Right. And he said, just get out here. And then <laughs> five minutes, five minutes later, you know, Quion Murphy called me and said, Hey, I got a room in my apartment. It's a hundred bucks a month. Wow. And I went, I went, okay. And so I, I, I went to the bank. A hundred dollars a month. Like you can't, yeah. you can't get Wi-Fi anymore for a hundred bucks a month. <laughs> oh no. We lived in a, we lived in a crappy, um, two bedroom garage apartment Ooh. that, that was, uh, it was amazing. I mean, it was amazing at that time. You <laughs> yeah, know I mean? yeah. Just to be with one of my best friends in the right. whole the whole planet, and to be in a new, exciting uh, place of Denton, Texas. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I, I basically loaded up the car and told mom I was moving to Texas, and you know, got my cash out of my bank account and, and moved to Denton, not really knowing what was going to happen. Right. But but I, it was again, it was the same thing. It was just this this focus of like, all right, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going right. to get at it. And I got there, and, and Doc, as he's referred to, was incredibly kind to me. Um, I wasn't even registered in school, and I started performing with the drumline. Wow. And um, he saw that I had some natural ability on congas because I had kind of experimented while being in the Blue Devils and being in San Francisco. So he put me in the steel band cool. playing congas, just yeah. kind of getting me kind of in the rotation <clears throat> of just what the school was about. And then, you know, I took my ACT and got into, got into school and then everything kind of just went full bore from there. Yeah. Yeah. So what was the, you know, um, when, when you got to North Texas, like you were kind of singularly focused on, on core and quads and drumline and that whole thing, I would imagine, you know, not long after you got to North Texas, um, you know, the, the hardcore orchestral stuff got thrown at you and the rigorous drum set program got thrown at you? Like, was there kind of a, a, a period of, of shock and awe <laughs> that you had to adjust oh, to yeah. being in that environment? I think the first day that I sat in a room with Doc and, and Paul Rennick and Ron Fink and auditioned, Yeah, you know, and I didn't meet Soph yet or, or um, the drum set instructor that I ended up working with, uh, Dan Robbins. Mm -hmm. Um I didn't know anything, man. I mean, to be completely honest, I was singularly focused. I had great hands. Yeah. That's all I had. Right. That's all I had. I didn't understand marimba. I didn't, you know. I mean, I knew the notes from, like, early concert band season when I had to play. You know, we had to do our concert band stuff in high school. Mm -hmm. And I could, you know, I could figure out where the stuff was. But if you put a piece of proper marimba music in front of me, there was no way I was going to sight read it. You right. know what I mean? Right. I thought the funniest part of my audition was – um, just playing 
I wouldn't say antiquated, but older rudiments that yeah. just weren't popular in core. Like uh. I remember they asked me to play a flam mill and I was like, what is that? Yeah. I don't even know what that is. And then it was like, it was just a flam with a, an accent on the first 16th, on the second 16th on the E. Right. Like, 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 and I went, oh, so you just want me to accent the second 16th note of, of you know, of 16th note flam thing. And, right, and right. he kind of, everybody just kind of looked at me puzzled and, <laughs> because that was just, that was just kind of like, a, you know, my language my language was blue double language. You know right. I mean? You had the cheese diddle and the book report and the Shirley Murphy yeah, and the scrapey doo dah. Never had a Shirley Murphy. That would be a Midwest thing. Okay. That was the, <laughs> the, the Midwest took that from. But we had Tom Float, who was the Tom Float, Scott Johnson were the kind of the guys that really built the program in the eighties. Mm-hmm. Um, I unfortunately did not get to um, experience teaching uh, teaching under those guys. Paul Rennick was there when I was in 91, and then Dave Glide was in there when I was in 92, both amazing teachers, and yeah. I learned a lot. But that language of float still lives there to this very day, right. um, and I was very fortunate enough to work with him while I was at North Texas. He came and mentored the drumline when I was there, yeah. so it was exciting. But getting back to the, to the, the audition, you know, I didn't know shit. I didn't know anything, right. and uh, but I think Doc had had a thing with – guys like me who were coming from the drum corps that he knew he could whip them into shape. He could right. beat on us yeah, and yeah. we wouldn't run crying to the university or, you know, he, yeah. he, and he loved us and he really spent a lot of time with all of us that were in, in the drum line. We were all in everything. I mean, we were in every ensemble. Yeah. There was a drum line guy in every ensemble and I mean, made point. it that way. That's a good point about drum line is that like, you know, most, most people who come out of, out of core, um, like it, it just instills such a work ethic in you. Um, so I, it, I think it was really perceptive of your North Texas professors to, to recognize that like we can pile onto this guy, we can be hard on him, we can put him in every ensemble. And cause like in core, you're used to just playing, all day, every day, absolutely and being challenged every day, and and you know in some cores being yelled at. But <laughs> oh yeah, no, that's how it goes. It's yeah. it's like it's like the military, you know. Yeah. I think it's I think it's good. I mean, I tell young people today, I think it's it's good for several reasons. I think it it, it improves uh, your what I call full body time mm-hmm. because especially now because the kids are marching in mixed meters and, and yeah. they're, they're going, you know, when I was in it, we were doing, you know, like the early days of fast marching, maybe like 160. Right. But now kids are marching at 225, <sighs> you know, and playing some incredibly difficult passages. Yeah. And, Just and, and the right dis- yeah. And the, and the diff- and you know, and, and it goes all the way around, even kids that are in the pit, what they're, what they're asked to play and, yeah. uh, uh, and then deal with on a daily basis. And mm-hmm. I think it makes, um, being a professional musician, a piece of cake yeah I, to me you know yeah so so anyhow yeah but like at north texas he just doc and paul rennick both uh and I, I would even say so and 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 all the teachers there uh recognized that they could definitely probably put a little bit more into us guys because we could take it we weren't really you know gonna crumble right, uh, right. and uh, and uh and i'm very i was very grateful for that opportunity you mentioned you mentioned that you had you had great hands and and not much else when you came in. Um, For sure. What was what was the process of sort of you know developing your your ear and your musical sense and your soul and and you know the rest of what is required to be a good musician? Oh, I think I had a great ear just because you have to have a great ear to be in a in a drum line to mm-hmm. listen and play and to play as one. And I think those skills transfer over immediately to being in a band. Yeah. Whether you're a drummer or you're a percussionist. Yeah. Uh, the intuition of when a phrase is going to come to an end and what's going to come next. I think that that was all built in the early days, even in high school with uh, Perry Hall, mm-hmm. my instructor back then. Um, so. It wasn't a giant transition. It was just learning a language, and Doc made it very easy to learn a language. I remember him uh, teaching me how to read, uh, especially mallet stuff, and just um, what I what he refers to, and what I still refer to as shape recognition, hmm. and looking at a shape, whether it be a rhythmical shape or, or a melodic shape, and knowing where that shape starts and where that shape ends, and how that shape sounds. Mm-hmm. And through that training, through him. It made everything really easy. He was very good at, as well as a lot of the teachers there were very good at teaching multiple different ways because people learn differently. Yeah. So I felt like I was never like in a in a box. Right. Um, 
And so everything kind of came. And then just the environment. You know, Denton is a small town. There really isn't much to do there. Uh, and it was a lot like it was a lot like uh, when I lived in Concord in the Blue Doubles. I mean, we all hung out. Mm-hmm. I lived in a house with another drummer who was doing the same thing I was doing and had the same struggles that I had. Um, and we all helped each other. And, and, and guys in the drum line, obviously, if someone was really sucking at marimba, there was somebody that was really good at marimba that would be like, hey, man, come over to my practice room. I know it's three in the morning, but, you know, like we got to get you through this so you, you can't fail. Right. Like nobody was going to fail. And it was like, I think that was even university wide in the percussion program because, you know, North Texas is notoriously known as a great school for, for music and mm-hmm. for drumming, mm-hmm. especially at that time. Yeah. Um, my freshman class was 300 people. Wow. And I remember D- Doc. Of drummers? Of drummers. Oh, my God. And I remember Doc sitting us in a, in a, in a hall, and he said, half of you will not be here next semester. And he was 100% right. Yeah. Um, everybody wants to go there, but the work that it takes to survive that place uh, is, is tough. Yeah. Everyone will tell you that there's mm-hmm. not, there's even the guys like Greg Bissonette who were there in the older days, you know, to guys that are there now that it's a different program with a different teacher. But I think the, uh, the work ethic is still there. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's in the walls, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Um, so it was a great place for me to learn. And, and, and there at the time that I was there, you know, Man, there were some great players there. I mean, drummer wise, Keith Carlock was there. Yeah, Ari Sutter. Honig, Sutter was he was gone. I okay. missed him. Okay. I missed Sutter, but his, you know, obviously he was in the drum line at North Texas, right. and so I knew yeah. about him. Jim Riley, Rich mm-hmm. Redman, um, Ari Honig was there, and then a lot of great players that not a lot of people know about, but there were great that that were that were are working now. You know right. what I mean? That, but they didn't have this mystique like they had when I was in school. I mean, right. when I was in school, I knew about Keith the first day I got there. It was like, Keith Carlock, you got to go see this guy. Holy crap. Man. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You know? Uh, and, and Ari was the same way. I remember I went to a recital and I was just blown away by him. You right. Know, right. Early, those, on, early on. Those two guys in, in particular seem just like, I mean, they, they are, of course, today singular players, but it seems like even when they were 19, they still had that singularity about them. And, and their peers, even at that time, were like, that holy shit, that dude. Yeah. I, you know, I, 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 yeah, that was, that was definitely the case. There were the upper, upper echelon cats yeah. that were that were at school that you were just like okay i'm gonna go watch those guys at the smallest dirtiest club and just to kind of get something right you know? right so and i never cool. i never uh i never attended a huge competitive uh university like that but it, it seems to me that succeeding in an environment like that has just as much to do with your personality as with your playing because some some personalities kind of thrive in that environment whereas others would just be beat down and, and intimidated. Um, and like, is that, is that something, do you feel you were cut out for that program or was it something you had to adjust to? I think it was a little bit of both. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, because coming from jump core and coming from that kind of real regimented bust your ass kind of teaching. Uh, but there were things that I had to learn in the process, you know, and, and, um, I had to learn a lot of patience, mm. you know, because because I didn't know a lot of things. So I would struggle and I would get frustrated like any young person would. And so I just had to learn patience and I uh, I had to fail. Mm. I had to fail. But I, and then I had to get up and figure out how to succeed. Right. Uh, which was really good for me. Uh, and it's still something that, you know, obviously we deal with as professional musicians yeah. now. Yeah. You know, is uh, getting on things and failing and then picking up the pieces and and moving on. Right. And so the university taught me that a lot. And, and, and doc, doc and Paul Rennick in particular were probably the, the, the biggest people that influenced me while I was there. The other uh, bit of history that we share is uh, your, your first touring gig out of college was with Joseph Vincelli, who is a Dallas based uh, smooth jazz saxophonist. Um, and I, I played with him when I lived in Kansas city, he would, he would come up during the summer and, and do like a little run through some Midwest cities. 
Um, so, so I did that with him on a, on a couple of summers, but, uh, I was, I was just like tickled to, to read that. I was like, Vincelli, no way. Um, yeah, yeah, it was crazy. Uh, I started with him, I was still in college, uh, but it was like the first really good paying thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was playing percussion and it was uh, a time in his career where he was, I guess, trying to do something different. He already had a percussionist. So it was uh it was him an upright bassist and three percussionists. Wow. And, and and we it was fun. It was uh two guys in Dallas that I didn't know very well, but they had kind of seen me um, playing around and uh, offered me to come and do this this short run of dates with them. And mm -hmm. then uh, like a lot of things in my career, I think once people realized I did more than play just percussion. Mm -hmm. Uh, then I got the drum chair and I did the drum chair for, I think about a year yeah, and then just kind of moved on to other things. Right. And you so. mentioned the, the bassist in that band, uh, was, was kind of a, a mentor to you for, for that time. Huge. And I, you know, I, it's so long ago. I can't remember his name. Oh, uh, I, I know. I wish I could remember his name. It's terrible. <laughs> uh, uh, but he, uh, was a, you know, a gospel church basis. Mm -hmm. And he just really emphasized pocket and what pocket meant to him. Mm -hmm. And um, just things that you have to learn on the bandstand, right. things that you can't learn in a classroom, things that you have to learn with guys that are much older than you, right. that have played music that you maybe were a child or an infant when was going, when things were going on. Yeah. Uh, and so his, his, teachings of of playing funk music and, and and not playing smooth jazz music let me there there is a big difference mm -hmm. because like the smooth jazz stuff is mainly programmed and it's super sterile yeah um he was coming more from a grover washington jr thing and right. more from the, the early steve gadd ralph mcdonald uh rhythm section that yeah. made grover huge right and and then you know referencing you know he was the first guy to ever reference Clyde Stubblefield to me. I mm -hmm. didn't know who that, I didn't know who that was. Mm -hmm. I knew who James Brown was, but I didn't know who Clyde Stubblefield was. Right. And, and he kind of opened the door for those early, um, great, you know, soul drummers yeah. and funk drummers, you know, it's Clyde, Jabo, Idris Muhammad, Bernard Purdy, and kind of just took away things from me too. I remember like we were on a gig and he, he took away the second rack tom. <laughs> and he, he 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 took away the he he took away the splash symbol. You know what I mean? <laughs> he took away all he took all the stuff that was was unnecessary to to what was important. Right, and that was you know kick snare hat, one rack, one floor ride, and a crash. Yep, and and and, and I'm grateful to him for that. And we you know we lost touch right after that gig. Mm -hmm. When that gig ended, you know I was I was like 23, and you know I was just ready to go do the next thing as I was when I was young. I think that's the thing that's gone through my career is just like, once something's done, I'm ready to go to the next thing. Yeah. And, and sometimes relationships get lost in that process. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I'm very grateful to him and it's a shame. I don't remember his name. Maybe we'll, uh, we'll figure it out. Maybe we'll email Joseph and we can put it on the, yeah. on the episode page. So, um, yeah, but, uh, I, I interviewed, uh, Jamie Tate recently and uh, talk to him quite a bit about playing with, with smooth jazz artists because he plays with David Benoit and was in Mindy A. Bear's band for a long time. And, and he, you know, we talked about kind of the virtues of smooth jazz and, and not just the, the things that it's maligned for. But he talked about from the drummer's standpoint, it's, it's you know, a perfect opportunity to learn about groove and learn about pocket and learn how to play as one with a bassist. Um, in a you know in a different context than you would in in a rock band or a top forty band or, or whatever. So it sounds like that that was kind of that experience for you. Absolutely, and and let me say this: Jamie Tate is a bad dude. He is a bad boy. He's a bad dude. <laughs> I, I, uh, he he plays with a uh, with my organ player. I have an organ trio, right? So they ha they have a group called Strangers, and and I've got to hang with him a couple times. And man, is he a sweetheart yep. man is he a bad dude yeah bad dude but and he's 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 got that he's got that pocket you know and, mm -hmm. and we we spoke about that briefly about the smooth jazz thing and i've done it here in la mm -hmm. um but i think playing in joe's band at that time with those people was like a grover washington style of playing it right and so if i want to play it that's how i want to play it yeah I can't, i'm not really interested in playing it how how 
it's been kind of homogenized yep. to a more um, programmed kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, you know, as you know, the heart of smooth jazz in, in Los Angeles is in Seal Beach, California. Oh, it's yeah. Bagatini's. And, yeah. and I, I did plenty of the Sunday brunches there <laughs> and, and uh, had my fill of it. But I think w- when I when I walked away from it, I walked away from it not because it wasn't a good gig or there weren't good people. It was just there was a certain thing that I really wanted to play, and it wasn't that. Right, right. You know, so. Um, so after that, you uh, you turned your focus to Austin? Uh, I went to New York first. Oh, okay. uh, So when I was in school, um, let's go back to that and just kind of get, get, gets there. But yeah. I, I got basically, I've said this many times before to, to folks, is that in order for me to get playing, because my I had hands, my feet were eh, and my <laughs> melodic stuff was non-existent, um, I wanted to play, and I wanted to play with other people uh, outside of drumline. I wanted that same feeling, you know? So percussion was a good thing. I dabbled with it in San Francisco. Um, I got a lot better at it when I got to North Texas because there were good instructors there, uh, mainly a guy named Jose Aponte, mm-hmm. who was a Puerto Rican grad student. Uh, who played with a, a famous band called Batacumbele. And he took some interest in me, and, and he really opened a lot of doors for me. And a lot of the other students that were interested in that kind of music, and especially Afro-Cuban music uh, and Puerto Rican folklore. Yeah. Uh, so he opened that up for us, and the five of us that were really involved kind of were like our own little gang. We practiced all the time, got better. So uh, I got to a point where you know, I was playing with drummers, and I, I've said that, for every 10 great drummers in North Texas, there was one percussionist. Hmm. So it was easy to play with great people. Yeah. Uh, and so through the process of learning with Jose and, and playing around town, I got in the one o'clock. And uh, when I got in the one o'clock, that's when I really started gigging. Mm-hmm. And that's how I got Joe's gig was I was in the one o'clock. He saw me at some point, as did a you're lot in, of people. You were in the one o'clock on set, not playing percussion. No, no, no. I was playing percussion. You were, okay, cool, cool. So I was playing percussion. And then what ended up happening was in that group of people, we were playing gigs and the, the drummers would, would sub out, right? Mm-hmm. And, and guys would show up and reading tunes and obviously not know what's going on because it's, it's just a sub gig. And band leaders would look over me at times and go, don't you play drums? And then I started getting gigs playing drums. Right, right. You know, and, and, and it was a great learning experience too because I, I, you know, I'm a visual learner, so being – around those great drummers that I was at from my first band was the four and went from four to one. Mm-hmm. I never did, you know, there's nine bands. Yeah. So I never really started at the bottom. I started kind of up at the top and then I went to the, the top top. Yeah. And, uh, why I was in the top, man. I mean, I was with two fantastic drummers, the two years I did it, 97 and 98, mm-hmm. uh, fantastic rich matchlet, uh, and Woody burner, both killing drummers mm-hmm. and super open to, if I had a question, if I was interested, they would, they would, you know, we'd talk and they liked me because I didn't get in the way. Right. You know, and I think that, that was the, again, going back to the drumline thing, I had good ears. I could listen. I could anticipate when they were going to play fills. I would not get in the way, you know? Yeah. Uh, this, and never, you're, you're touching on one thing I wanted to ask you about because you're, you know, you kind of have, uh, you know, each foot in the, the percussion world and the drum set world. Sure. Um, and I, uh, another one of my interviews a while back was Cassandra Kokosius, who's, uh, okay. an LA percussionist. She plays with beat mosaic. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so I asked her about, uh, you know, her advice to, to drum set players who are playing with percussionists. And, and she mentioned that a lot of drummers just step on percussionist toes. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to ask you, since you come at it from both angles, like what, what can, what advice can you add to that in terms of drummers playing with a percussionist? Well, I would echo her sentiments. I mean, drummers definitely overplay. Mm-hmm. Uh, and percussionists are notorious for playing too much as well. Mm-hmm. And both parties are guilty. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'll start with percussion first. I think percussionists that I see now, um, they go, for, they go for the big instruments first. They go for the congas. They go for the timbales. They go for the bongos. And sometimes it's just a shaker. Right. And sometimes it's just a tambourine. And sometimes it's colors. And I think it's just really knowing, um, sorry, trash guys coming by. It's That's loud. right. Uh, um, I think it's just knowing, A, the style of music you're playing, and 
sometimes less is more. Mm-hmm. And that's a, that's a sentiment that's echoed through so many different types of percussion training. Um, yeah. And it's the same thing with drum set, you know. Uh, I'll give you an example. Example that uh, that has happened to so many of my students. If we're playing a sixteenth note funk group, and the, and the drummer's playing a sixteenth sixteenth notes on the hi hat, don't play sixteenth notes on the shaker. <laughs> you're just cloud. You're just clouding up the groove, right. right? So if he's if he's covering all those sixteenth syncopations, find some eighth note or quarter note syncopations to get involved in, mm-hmm. or find space. And I think that's really hard for percussionists is to find space. And we're speaking in a pop context, right. you know what I mean? Uh, and that's another thing. If you're coming from an Afro-Cuban training or Brazilian training or African training, um, sometimes you want to infuse those rhythms into places they don't belong. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's tough to not do because you have all these, these rhythms and you want to show everybody what you got. Right. But sometimes, you know, it's, it's that maturity of, of like taking a step back and putting some space in things. And uh, so that's, that's one thing. And I think from the drummer's perspective is when you're playing with a percussionist, just open your ear a little bit more and lay off the fills and, and, and you know, see if you can, you can become uh, the sound of one. Yeah. And, and that's a hard thing for a lot of drummers because we're used to kind of setting up everything and mm-hmm. we're, used to, we're used to playing everything that we need to play. And, and damn it, we got this person next to us that's clouding up the rhythm. You know what I mean? <laughs> And so, and, and just also too, it's having, having a dialogue, you know what I mean? With the percussionist, like, you know, like talk, hang out, listen to music together, yeah. you know, play together. That's the one thing that we don't do as the drummer and percussionist um, clicks. We don't, and especially in LA, we don't play together enough. Mm-hmm. We don't sit in rooms and play together enough. There mm-hmm. are cats that do that and they have successful bands mm-hmm. and, and, uh, and they are successful in those things. You know, there's a reason why you see the same guys on the same gigs, mm-hmm. but you know, there's, there's a reason why Kevin Ricard is, is always playing with the same drummers as a percussionist. Do you right. know what I mean? Because they love him because he gets out of the way, Yeah. you know, and again, we're speaking in a pop context. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, so that's, that's my two cents on it. I, I, I love playing with percussionists and I love, you know, I don't really play percussion that much anymore. Mm -hmm. I think, I think as, as I've gone along, I've been kind of more focused on drums, but Mm -hmm. when I did do it and I did it, you know, up until five years ago, I I got a really good rep for playing around town for just being able to leave space. Right. Right. You know, and play, if I needed to play Latin stuff, great. If I needed to solo on timbales and sound like, I, I know what I was doing and I wasn't just flailing away. Right. I, I was able to do that. And yeah. uh, it, it did. It definitely, you know, did me well. So take me through the, the journey from from Dallas to New York to Austin. So one o'clock lab band goes to IEG in New York City. Mm-hmm. I've never really been to New York as an adult. Uh, and, and have a lot of free time on my hands to go around and, and realize how great the city is and know that there's a great school there that Tito Puente started called Boys Harbor hmm. and that I really wanted to go to. And so I, you know, we're on a break we're, we have a day off. I go to the, I go to a Spanish Harlem, take a train, Spanish Harlem and, and go to this school and, you know, do my best to, to, to get a lesson and, and here come, I'm looking super gringo, super white boy, you know, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, these old Puerto Rican guys look at this kid and just like, what the hell is he doing here? You know right, what I mean? Right. And uh, I wasn't able to take a lesson that day, but just being around the city and going and, you know, going to the jazz clubs and seeing guys play and, and even seeing a couple of my heroes play, um, I, I wanted to be there. So mm-hmm. I figured out a way to stay there. I didn't stay too long. I just stayed. I, I went back to school. I was done with with school, and I went back to New York, and I stayed for about uh, about almost a year. Mm-hmm. And I loved the city. I loved the energy that the city had. Uh, but I, I think I'm too much California. I'm just too laid back, and <laughs> I don't I, I don't like cold weather. And yeah, I, I think taking my drums on. Uh, you know, I was not playing a lot of drum set at the time. I went went to New York because I really wanted to get that 
you know, New York salsa thing. Mm-hmm. And so taking your congas or timbales on the subway really sucks, yeah. <laughs> you, you know, and especially at five o'clock or any time, you know, that's rush hour and people are, you know, cussing at you in multiple languages because uh, you're, you're, you're taking up space, right, you know? Right. Uh, <clears throat> but it was a good, it was a good opportunity. I, I really loved it. From there, I, uh, I came back to Texas, uh, stayed in, in Denton for a little while. I was playing with a, a, a really great band, called Mingo Fish Trap. Uh, it was like a, a funk band, and we mm-hmm. were like opening for like the Neville Brothers and, yeah. and Little Feet and doing all this great stuff. So it was exposing me to more great music. And um, I decided that I, I, I would go to Austin because mm-hmm. that, at the time that that was, you know, a little bit more of an open music scene than Dallas was. Dallas was a rock town, right? You know, and and it was a there was like really heavy on the rock, and there was some you know there was cool things happening, but I I think again this is a thing where I'm finished with it. I'm I, I didn't graduate school. Mm-hmm. I was just I just started playing, mm-hmm. and I think the more I played, the more I got away from things, and that's mm-hmm. you know I went, and then going to New York and seeing what that was all about. Coming back, I I didn't really want to get back in school. I think I just wanted to play. Right. So and, I and but before you go on, sorry to interrupt you, but it's it's interesting how you you talk about your time in New York, like you you spent a year there or a little less, and it it sounds like you you treated it as just kind of a a long um, not a vacation, but a, a long sort of educational uh, residency for yourself, and not necessarily you didn't approach it thinking like I'm going to go to New York and I'm going to make it there and I'm going to live there forever. You just was like, I'm going to expose myself to everything the city has to offer for a while and kind of absorb it and, and then move on. I think I go, I, that, that's just, I go there with that intention mm-hmm. of exposing myself. And then if I like it, I stay. Right. Okay. You know, and I just, again, I was too California. It was too laid back. I don't like cold weather. You know, when yeah. it snowed, I was just not not really, you know, <laughs> one to really enjoy that very much. Um, I, I did dig the people. I did dig the music. Uh, I did. I did dig the intensity, you know, for as laid back as I am. Yeah. Uh, the intensity was very similar to drum corps. Yeah. You know, the cats, they're really intense and they want things a certain way. And so I dug that. But I, I didn't really see myself staying there. Mm-hmm. And so I went back to Texas and and uh, and, you know, started playing around and and uh ended up on a gig in austin and when i went to austin it, it just seemed it was the right time for me to be there yeah and so when i went back home to denton and this is we were doing this is this band mingo fish trap we were kind of doing this residency and driving down there every tuesday mm. and playing at this place called the steamboat which is like you know kind of a legendary club stevie ray bond played there and mm-hmm. so after a couple times of doing that gig i i was just like man i uh i think i want to live here so I went back home, packed all my stuff, and came down to Austin, found a place to live, and, and just started digging into the scene. And uh, it, and in between those times of being there, you know, I also went and stayed in New Orleans for a bit because playing with the Nevels and seeing that kind of thing, and, and Galactic was just starting at that time. Yeah. Just I, I wasn't really clued into what was happening in New Orleans. And I knew about Zigaboo, you know, and I, I you know, Model S from the meters. and. Mm-hmm. Uh, I knew that, you know, obviously there's some great drumming traditions in there. And, and it was my first around that time too, my first exposure to brass band with the rebirth. And so I, you know, I started just getting in my car and driving down to New Orleans just to check it out and see what it was all about and, yeah. and hang out and, and, uh, just rub a little bit of that, you know, stuff on me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so yeah, it was good. And I was in Austin until 2003, and and after that time, I came back out to Los Angeles. Yeah. Um, um, and so, what was the you know Austin? Austin is a, a, a very highly regarded music town. Um, so, what were uh, what were some of the traditions you encountered in Austin, and and do you have a sense of how it's changed since the time you lived there? Uh, it's changed a lot. <laughs> I lived there a lot, uh, just with gentrification and and just folks moving there, but. Yeah. Uh, when I moved there uh, at the end of 99, top of 2000, it was the dot-com boom or the first level of the dot-com boom. Mm. So there was a lot of work. I think that was one of the reasons I moved there. It was super exciting. But uh, one thing that I found right away that, uh, that I knew a little bit about when I was living in Dallas was the blues yeah. uh, and the tradition of the blues and uh, specifically uh, a Monday night residency that was happening at a famous blues club called Antones. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so every Monday night they had this thing called blue Monday 
And it was pretty much, you know, legendary blues players would come to town. And so that was a good place for me to go and kind of get a bit of that, uh, get, get some of that ideas rubbed around in my head about the blues yeah. and watching drummers and, and things like that. So mm -hmm. uh, in particular, a drummer that really kind of rocked my world was a guy named Ben Smith. He uh, went by the nickname Frosty. <laughs> and um, he was an amazing drummer. Uh, he, he had been all over the place. And his, I guess his main thing was he was in an organ duo uh, Lee Michaels was this organ player singer and they were in this organ duo together. It was real popular in wow. like the late sixties, early seventies. Yeah. And he was just a real cool player. I, I would say a giant influence on me. Yeah. Um, as well as a couple of the drummers, you know, a, a drummer by the name of Earl Harvin is a big influence on me. He was a North Texas guy. I knew about him in Dallas. Um, a giant influence, uh, JJ Johnson who plays with Tedeschi trucks now, yeah, but he yeah. was, a, he was a local drummer and, uh, Brandon Temple. Mm -hmm. So all those four guys were just giant influence. They were all different players. And, and through some of them, I found out about a great jazz player by the name of Sebastian Whitaker, who I'd, I'd seen when I was at North Texas. He's mm -hmm. a blind jazz drummer from Houston. Huh. And uh, amazing, man. Amazing cat. And he would come up and play in Austin and Dallas. And, and so, you know, seeing all these guys got a wide mix and they all played a lot of different styles, mm -hmm. you know, like Brandon and JJ and Earl were all great jazz drummers, great funk drummers. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Frosty was a, a, a really great blues drummer, singer, songwriter, drummer, weird New Orleans -y kind of, yeah. he, had, uh, he had a lot of weird jank stuff. And, <laughs> and, 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 and as well as Earl had that too, some weird janky things. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd seen JJ play with, you know, the great Doyle Bram Hall Jr. doing the rock kind of Hendrixy thing. Yeah. Playing giant drums and, you know, and all these guys, you know, were traditional grip players. Right. Which was also a big influence on me, too, because I was working, you know, I, I'd always done that, but I was kind of at that point in my life really committed to doing that, mm -hmm. you know. And so kind of watching them play and you know, all those guys really influenced. And there was a ton of other drummers that, influenced me in throughout texas and, yeah. and new york and new orleans but those guys have still had a a big imprint on me as a person as a drummer yeah you know what so. um what did you sort of absorb about about texas blues specifically because you know there's been many conversations and and whatever about the differences and distinctions between texas blues and chicago and delta and and et cetera et cetera can can you speak on on sort of the the salient features of of what makes Texas blues? Uh, the quarter note hmm. for me for me personally, you know, uh, if you're playing one of variations of the Texas shuffle, mm -hmm. the le the right foot and the right hand are are playing together, and they have to be completely on their own thing mm -hmm. because what's happening in the left hand cha 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 cha, -cha is is this thing of it's what did the best way someone said to me? It's like a woman's hips. They never, they never move consistently. <laughs> they sway. Yeah. They sway. So your, your right side of your body is the rock and your left side of your body is the roll, mm. you know? And, and, um, there were so many great guys that, that, that had no technique that I really dug just by you know being around the city, I would just go to a couple places uh, and watch guys play. Right. Um, and one guy I watched, he was an open-handed player, um, and he used to, with his right hand, just like a windshield wiper, go back and forth with the shuffle beat. Ch -ch 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 he would just kind of be like, you know, wax on, wax off kind yeah, of yeah. vibe, you know? <laughs> uh, but the way that it, it, with him moving around to the different parts of the snare drum, just created that feel. And what, and that's what I realized about the blues in general. I, I don't consider myself a, a master of the blues. I'm still kind of figuring it out as I go along. Mm -hmm. But it's a feel thing. And, and, and it's very similar to how Afro-Cuban music is yeah. and, and, and how African music is. It's something that's not really put on the page. Yeah. It's just something that you have to be around guys and you have to experience it. And, and um, it's not a pattern. Right. It's a lifestyle, <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's the food, it's, it's the people, it's the experiences, uh, it's old men yelling at you because they're just bummed out that you don't understand what, what's in their brains. Right. Uh, or, you know, older women. I mean, I've been with some blues singers that just yelled at me and I, I just, 
didn't know or some salsa singers just i didn't know what they were thinking right or same with with you know both men and women i it, it, whether they're instrumentalists or singers i just wasn't sure what they were thinking so we had to have that conversation to get you get it out what they were thinking mm-hmm. and sometimes that's nothing musical that's like a color or uh uh an intangible thing yeah. that they put out there. Right. So, and I was, so, I was going to say not, not a lot of this, <clears throat> excuse me, not a lot of this is very tangible. Like either it feels good or it doesn't. Right. And, and there's not, there's not a, a documented technique or notation or whatever that you can no. kind of follow. You just kind of fig, got to figure out a, what feels good and B how you personally have to execute that. Like what yeah. you have to do technically. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I'm a hey, man. I mean, like I'm in that journey now, my career of, of, of learning how to play jazz and it's the same thing. Wow. You know, yeah. it's the same thing. You know, uh, uh, I, I didn't do jazz when I was at North Texas cause it, it wasn't that I didn't want to do it. It just, I wasn't ready to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, I wasn't, I, I didn't have that. I didn't have the, the skills or the, and, and there were other skills that needed to be learned first. Right. So now that's something, you know, I'm doing in my career now for me. You know, because we all know jazz gigs don't really pay. <laughs> <laughs> well, especially in Los, especially in Los Angeles, California. Yeah, you man. know what I mean. Yeah. So, yeah. so I'm happy to go out and 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 you know, uh, I'm I'm I live in a cool spot where there's you know a couple jazz restaurant gigs down the street from my house that mm-hmm. fifty bucks in dinner, and I'm okay with that because it's it's a good place to kind of get those skills together and just have them. Yeah. You know. Just well, that's, so that's interesting so. that you're you're pursuing that at at this point. Um, talk about talk about that process. Like, are you are you taking lessons with someone? Are you putting yourself through it? Like, what what's the process? I think right now because I'm I'm really terrible. Uh, <laughs> uh, I doubt it. I, I, well, you know, I think I'm. I, you know, I have a good friend in, in uh, Ramon Banda. He's mm-hmm. a, a very famous timbali player from yeah. Juancho Sanchez, but also a great jazz player. Yeah, uh, plays with Joey and, Di Francesco, right? Yeah, so yeah. he's been a good friend of me and a mentor for many, many years. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's kind of we've we've sat down and talked about things. Um, I like his perspective because he doesn't read music; mm. he's learned it by ear. Mm-hmm. So he has that thing, and I wanted that because it reminds me of you know learning the blues stuff that I did, and, right. and a lot of a lot of traditions that I've learned uh, are oral traditions. Yeah, and and then you know I go around and watch great players around town. You know. Um, I was taking lessons with a cat named Alex Smith, mm-hmm. who's a, a young jazz drummer. Um, I dug him because he plays piano too. So when cool. I would take a lesson with him, he would be playing piano when we were would get together and, and play. And I hate those guys. Yeah, he, <laughs> and he's re- well, you know, he's he's just he's yeah, he's one of those guys. <laughs> so it's good. And then you know, like I mean, we have we have a, an influx of, of, of players here. You know what I mean? We've got young guys coming out of USC. Mm-hmm. We've got people from New York that are moving here now. Um, the Cal Arts thing. Yeah. So there's a lot of different players around town. Um, I mean, who do, if I think about people that I like, obviously, you know, the, 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 on the money is Jeff Hamilton or yeah. Joe LaBarbera. Right. You know what I mean? But, but then there's like, you know, like you've had Tina Raymond, she's killing, Yep. you know, she's killing, I think all around great drummer. But the thing that I love about her is her brush playing. Yeah. You know, her brush playing is like some of the best I've seen in the city, mm-hmm. you know, and then Dan Schnell, man, and he's killing. Yep. Or or Aaron McClendon. Yeah. You know? AMAC. AMAC's burning, man. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's on a, on a level that, you know, I pray to get to at some point in my life. Yeah. You know, but I, I think I went to someone like Ramon or Alex because I find them to be groove players. Right. Yeah. And Tina has that, too. Mm-hmm. She has that Blakey thing. They all have that Blakey thing. Yeah. You know, where the quarter note is the ruler, but right. they can do they can do so many other things. But that is a big part of their playing. And so <laughs> I, I, I think I love all those players for that. Yeah. Um, and it enhances everything else I'm doing in my life. It's mm-hmm. made it made every other aspect of my playing good. It's lightened up my touch a lot, which I needed to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's all been a, an amazing process. You yeah. know, it's, and it's still going on. I'm I'm not where I want to be, but at least I have an idea of where I'm going. Yeah, join join the club. <laughs> it's great. I mean, that's the great thing about drumming is like it never ends. Yep. There's always something to do, and it's, it's I think that's why when I was at North Texas, I didn't get bummed out that I wasn't doing jazz mm-hmm. because I played with some of the best cats in school. Mm-hmm. So I know what it's supposed to be. I know what it's supposed to feel like. You know, I've been on the bandstand. You know, and and watched 
some great players, yeah. you know, and, and, ha- and played with some great uh, legends. I mean, you know, John Riley came to school. I got to play with him sitting in the percussion chair. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. That was amazing. Uh, you know, Peter Erskine came and played. Mm-hmm. Um, and Joe LaBarbera came and played. And, and so, you know, and then just guys that I've got to sit next to because – that if we're in big band or we're in a small group situation and there's that one Latin tune or that one Brazilian tune that they want to play. So I'm just chilling out. And I, I, you know, a lot of guys would say, man, why are you doing those gigs? Those are, those are so lame. You're playing only one song, man. It was about watching those cats that I was playing with and just getting information. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I always say to my students now that anytime you can sit around a great drummer, that's more paint to put on your palate. Mm hmm. You know, like what you get and, and, you know, anything like when you and I played together, how you approach New Orleans drumming is not how I approach it, but right. I got something from it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you likewise, know, I got, yeah. yeah, I got, you know, that's the thing. It's like how you you gathering information. I'm just gathering information from everybody I play with. Yeah. And, and how to do it. And it was the same thing when I was doing all the Latin stuff, you know, whether I was playing congas or timbales or bongos, who I was playing with. Yeah. Gathering, gathering information that made me rise to the top you know because it's it's you know i would say this when you're playing latin music generally speaking they don't want the gringo around you know what i mean you're, <laughs> you're gonna get criticized because you know they it's not that they don't want you around i, I shouldn't say that i should say that they're just not sure if you know what you're doing right they're suspicious yeah they're suspicious <laughs> and and you know when i was doing it in in texas and and and, and when i first came to la I, a lot of guys were suspicious but i think the thing that kept me alive and working and being the only one to do it at that time was I had good ears from drumline. It all stems from that, those early days. And yeah. and I could sit in the pocket, play, play congas, not fill, just play time. The timbali player on my first gig loved me so much. He took me under his wing and really changed my life as far as that music mm-hmm. really taught me a lot of stuff, you know, yeah, just yeah. as it has with everything, you know, I meet somebody you get under their wing, you know, just like right now I'm with Ramon and, and yeah. he's teaching me a lot. Mm-hmm. He's teaching me a lot of things that are not in books and not, 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 not are there. Not, not that's in, in those, those um, educational things. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just the things that are just, he's learned from experience. And then get with someone like Alex Smith, who is a very studied guy, went to CSUN and did a very steady thing and that get that perspective, mm-hmm. you know, or, or, or my friends that are in the Cal Arts world, their perspective from La Barbara. You know, yeah. or guys that have like Jamie, who studied with Peter Erskine, right. Jamie Tate, you know, he gave me a little bit of perspective. I, I, I asked him about something one time and, you know, mm-hmm. and so it's just getting, you know, gathering information. That's my thing. Yeah. Just gather, gathering yeah, yeah. information. So talk about your transition from, from Austin to back to L.A. Did you grow up in L.A.? I did. Okay. I did. I, I split my time between uh, Studio City. That's where my dad was living mm-hmm. and Riverside which is about 75 miles east. Yeah. And, uh, it, you know, growing up as a kid, well, you know, it wasn't so bad when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, being in L.A. with my cousins and family here brought a different sp- perspective musically for me. Going back to Riverside uh, just gave me a lot of freedom to just work because mm-hmm. there wasn't a lot of stuff going on. It's right. a sleepy little uh, town at that time that had a Dixie cup plant and a sun kissed orange plant, you know? <laughs> so a lot of space, um, you know, a, a lot of places for me to go and practice, you know, uh, if I drove my mom crazy, I could drive up to the Dixie cup plant, set up my drum set or my quads or my snare drum in the parking lot and play. Oh, that's great. You, you know, because there wasn't nobody around, Yeah. you know? And, and so that no, was a good thing. Nobody except the sun. <laughs> well, true. But this was at nighttime. I was okay. There. Good, good. <laughs> I drive my mom crazy to about you know like six or seven, and she'd be like, "I've had enough of you." And then you know, I throw whatever, whatever, whatever you know at the time was either snare drum, quads, or a drum set in in my car, mm-hmm. and drive up to the Dixie Cup plant and put a piece of cardboard down, put my drum set up, or you know, put put up a set of quads or something, and, and practice. And and that was a great thing for me to have. And uh, and then, you know, I would have never probably been set on the path mm-hmm. because, you know, I had that great instructor in Perry Hall out there who was coming to teach us. And, you know, it was uh, it was just easy. It was easy to practice. I think if I grew up in L.A., I don't think I would be the drummer that I am today. Mm-hmm. I think I'd be too uh, 
freaked out by everything else that was going on. You know what I mean? Just yeah. all the all the things to get involved in. So yeah. it was a good it was a good balance being with dad, you know, uh, uh, and coming up here and hanging out with him in L.A. and then going back home to mom and in Riverside. So it was good balance. To yeah. me. But but leaving Austin, basically, nine eleven happened. Um, I was working a ton. Mm-hmm. And I was doing commercials. I was playing all kinds of gigs, and it was great and touring. And then, man, the bottom just dropped out. Mm. Um, because at that time, a lot of work from L.A. was coming to Austin. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a right-to-work state, so you know the union didn't really have a, much of a presence, and right. and you know, so there was a lot of work. Yeah, uh, there was a ton of work, and and rent was three hundred bucks. Oh my god! You know, and <laughs> uh, yeah, I lived in a, a three-bedroom ranch house. And I had my own room with my own bathroom and entrance for my dog and, and and a practice studio. And I think my bills total for the month were 500 bucks, you know. And, and so I could do one session in Austin for 500 bucks yeah. and rent's paid. So it was a good thing. And you could play six nights a week, seven right. nights a week. Right. Uh, I was good and go out of town. And um, so once 9-11 hit, uh, everything kind of just dried up, you mm-hmm. know, it, it, and um, – I got a call from a buddy who was uh, working on this show called Blast. It was like a Broadway show that had drum and bugle corps elements in it. Yeah, I know Blast, yeah. And so he said, hey, listen, I need you because we're going to Disneyland's California Adventure, and we're going to be posted up there doing a show four times a day. And I need someone who can play congas, who can play marimba, who can play snare drum. I need you to do this rack thing where you got to play you know, with 10 other guys, and, and I trust you. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, he goes, what are you doing right now? I've got nothing. He goes, well, your pops is here and, and you know, you got family here and you ever thought about coming back to LA? And at that point I, I didn't, mm-hmm. but when he kind of sold it the way he sold it with the, with the, the money that he put behind it and that I was going to, you know, ha- have an easy transition to get back home. Yeah. I just said, cool. Yeah. Packed it up. And I said, if anything, if I don't really want to be back in LA or LA doesn't really agree with me, uh, I can always come back to Austin. Mm-hmm. You can so just do I, this, do this run with Blast, and then go back. Go back, yeah. So I went out because you know they put me up. I didn't have to get an apartment. They took yeah. care of everything. Yeah. So we were playing at Disney, and uh, it was supposed to last a year. It lasted four months, hmm. and uh, I decided to stay. Hmm. You know, I decided to stay, and I, I met uh, in that production. I met a trumpet player by the name of Sean Billings. Yeah, I know Sean. And uh, Sean pretty much uh, set my path in the salsa world in LA. Right. He's the one that got me on my first gig, the gig that I, I said that I played congas and the Timbali player took a liking to me. Mm-hmm. He set me on that gig. He put me on, that was one of the better bands in LA. Yeah. And uh, he, he opened that door and he vouched for me and he got the band leader who was super skeptical to kind of, <laughs> you know, let, let this super spiky haired, fresh faced gringo walk in and play some congas. Right. Well, Sean, you know, you know one gringo vouched for the other. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was good. No, it was great. And it opened uh, all the doors for me, you know, as far as that world. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah. So then uh, I just basically uh, moved back up to LA from Orange County and, and started my path and started working and yeah. uh, splitting my time, you know, doing the, doing the Latin stuff and, Playing with singer songwriters and and, right. and, just, and you did you, know, you did quite a long stretch with Ozo Motley, right? I did two years with that band playing drums, uh-huh. um, and it was great. It was my first, uh, it was my first big touring gig in LA. Yeah, uh, I think I'd been in LA like eight nine months mm-hmm. when I got the audition for that, and uh, it was cool. It was great. I mean, the one obviously one of my favorite bands. Yeah, still to this day, and and it was an honor to to. Uh, and I just basically held the seat for Mario Caleri. He mm-hmm. was taking a break. He had a kid. Mm-hmm. And um, so I knew that he was going to come back at some point. Mm-hmm. So I said, well, let me just ride this wave as long as I could get it. So I did it for like a year and a half maybe or a year and a couple months. And then he came back and then he took some more time off and I came back and did some more stuff. And and it was cool, you know, obviously um, – playing that gig because it had so many drummers at that point that had done it and done the recordings. Right. So, you know, copping the style for each of them, it was a very tough gig in that. It was definitely one of the hardest gigs I've played because all the stylistic things that I had to cover mm-hmm. from, me, from each drummer, 
Right. And it, and it wasn't just a, you know, a Latin gig. It was a hip hop gig. It was a rock gig. It was dance stuff. It was, it was, uh, you know, a, a wide variety of Latin styles that I had to play authentically and inauthentically. Right. <laughs> you, you know, because it's bastardized, it's bastardized to fit that band. Yeah. And it taught, it taught me a lot about that and, and um, opened my eyes to that and, and how to, start taking all these Latin things that I have learned traditionally and, and because I'm not bound to the tradition because it's culturally not my background, Mm -hmm. I'm able to break them and, and, um, not offend anybody. Right. Right. You know, because it's not where I come from. Yeah. So it's, it's, that was a cool thing. And that's something that I still to the do to this very day, Mm -hmm. you know, is, is I'll find myself inventing things or taking things from, uh, Latin things that I've learned through my time, you know, studying yeah, and breaking them and, and coming up with new vis- new, interesting ways to, to repurpose them. Right. Right. Yeah. So speaking of Sean Billings, uh, one of your, one of your main, uh, activities right now is with this group jungle fire. Correct. Yeah. And that's been going on for a while, right? Four or five years now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So talk about that band a little bit. Um, that band started, uh, with a bass player by the name of Joey Reyna. Joey was in a really cool kind of acid jazz raw funk band called, uh, uh, Simple Citizens. Uh, and my practice space was down from his Mm -hmm. and, um, his, one of his band members came in, was banging on my door one day because I was practicing timbales just banging. I was just like, screw this guy. Shut up. I'm practicing. <laughs> and, uh, and I opened the door and was like, what? And he was like, Hey man, I really dig your stuff. You should come down and meet my band. And I just met those guys, all the guys that were in the band and, um, we became friends. And so my relationship with Joey built from that point, And he asked me one day, Hey, listen, I'm putting this band together. that's going to play Latin breaks from like the seventies in Chinatown. And I want you to play timbales. I show up to the bandstand. There's Sean Billings <laughs> and, and, and a couple other guys. Uh, it was 11 guys at that point. And uh, when we finished the gig, I, I turned to Joey and I said, hey, man, uh, this is really cool. I'd really like to be a part of this. Let me, would you be open to me inviting some different guys that I think would fit this, this uh, band better? Mm-hmm. And so I invited Steve Haney on percussion and uh miguel also ramirez on percussion and sean was on trumpet i said there's a two other great guys i think would be great for this band uh otto granillo on trombone and sam robles on barry sax and flute Mm -hmm. and and he said yeah i'm thinking about getting my rhythm section which was uh this drummer by the name of sam halterman on drums uh patrick bailey on guitar judd mcdaniel on guitar and i think that would be the good rhythm section in the back Mm -hmm. And then we started kind of, you know, getting together and messing around with tunes, mostly cover tunes at the beginning. Yeah. And uh, Steve Haney basically turned and said, we should make a 45. <laughs> and and kind of really, you know, um, we picked it. We picked a tune. Uh, we picked a fella tune mm-hmm. called uh, Coman Samos. Uh, I think it was called Let's Start. That's what he called it. Let's start. And it made the tune made its way to uh, Columbia. And got reimagined as this, you know, psychedelic uh, Afro-Colombian tune called Coman Samos. Mm-hmm. So we did our version of that. And in like the the last minute of the tune, put in a, a, a breakbeat, you know, with uh, batas and timbales and congas, but mainly had that hip hop breakbeat thing. Right. And uh, for DJs, for yeah. guys to, to do two turntable type stuff. And then uh, on the B side, we did a, a tune that, that Steve wrote called Tokuta, which mixes uh, Makuta, which is an Afro Cuban rhythm, uh-huh. with uh, kind of a little bit of an Afro beat vibe. And uh, had a, you know, got my first time to really uh, shine on a timbali solo on that, on that band. Yeah. And that, that 45 just blew up for us. I mean, it really just, I mean, we gave it to a couple DJs. Next thing you know, uh, a great DJ by the name of Cut Chemist, mm-hmm. who was with Ozo Motley yeah. and, and with a ton of people, he put up a YouTube video of, of it, of it cutting it up between the breakbeat sections. Wow. And uh, it went 
stupid crazy. Yeah. Uh, we put out another 45. Uh, at that point, I, I, I took a break from the band because I was touring, and Alberto Lopez took over my spot on Timbales. Uh, they put out that second 45 that gained more traction. Uh, by the time I came back in the band, uh, Miguel Oso Ramirez had split, and he's with a, a really big Latin alternative band called La Santa Cecilia. Mm-hmm. And Alberto, you know, we just basically started switching around on percussion. So yeah. we all played t- timbales, congas, and bongos, and yeah. shekere and stuff. And then the oh, band must, started must be a blast to just do Chinese fire drill around all the percussion. It's amazing, you know, and we are the we are the front of the band. Right. We we tow the front of the stage, and uh, you know, um, all the same guys are still in the band. You know, we 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 haven't really changed any members, um, and it's a to me, I'm I feel very blessed because it's hard to get ten guys in yeah. L.A. to put time into something like this because it's not. A ch- there's no charts right we're not a band that reads charts we're not a band that kind of you know it's not a jazz situation yeah you it's a band it out. yeah we got to work it out so uh we put out a record uh, a couple years ago on national records it's mm-hmm. titled tropicoso um and it's done very well for us it, we were able to go to colombia and play yeah i was festival. gonna say you, you toured colombia like a year ago right year and a half yep. yeah yeah we did a great festival in monpos which is uh right outside of cartagena mm-hmm. and that was really exciting for us uh, we we've been to lincoln center outdoors yeah. um you know we've done great stuff grand performances here in los angeles and uh, it's a really you know again I, I feel very lucky um a that i get to be with two of my good friends Alberto and Steve, and yeah. we, we get to share our love of, of, of all this huge amount of African-based music, you know, Cuban music, Colombian music, Puerto Rican music, and African music, and then hybridize it with, a, with a, you know, the rhythm section, mm-hmm. you know, because the thing I say about this band that's amazing is Sam the drummer, Joey the bass player, and Patrick and Judd the guitar players, they don't know anything about clave or the origins of it, and we've always kept it that way that's a feature not a bug no the, yeah. that's a good it's a really good thing because i want to know what they're they when we play something what do they initially hear right and and the band is a beat driven band yeah you know it's it's definitely coming from a dj hip-hop perspective mm-hmm. um so everything that's they set the tone and then we just add the sauce on top of it with the horns and the percussion. Yeah. Uh, and so it's been really great for us. You know, we just put our second record in the can, uh, which is called John Boo. And, um, I think that's going to come out in November. Super excited about that. Mm -hmm. It's a very different departure from the first record in that it really sounds like a band because Mm -hmm. we've been a band now for going on five years. Right. Uh, it sounds like a, a, a process of not baiting people into kind of getting in the studio. We actually all got in a room. Uh, we get in a, a real small room <laughs> and we work, we work it out and, and it's, it's been exciting and I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm really pumped on, on this next one. I think it's going to do a lot of great things. Yeah. Nice man. Um, and the other, uh, you mentioned it earlier, but your other original project that you started up more recently is the white blinds. Yeah. Organ organ trio. Trio. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, with Carrie Frank on, Hammond B3 organ and bass pedals and mm-hmm. Patrick Bailey from Jungle Fire on guitar and myself on drums. And, and that is, uh, you know, it's almost like what we talked about at the top with Joe Vincelli. It's me getting back to that funk. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I consider it more jazzy funk than, than like hard hitting. I think when people think funk, they think more 70s. Right. Uh, a hard hitting. I'm coming for that when the jazz guys – or jazzy type guys were playing funk like Idris Muhammad, right. Bernard Purdy, Mike Clark, mm-hmm. uh, Joe Dukes, those guys. And so, you know, I've got bebop drums with a, with a crack and snare basically. Yeah. Uh, and I love it. You know, I, um, playing with an organ player is been my dream for a long time. Dude, I'm obsessed with the B3 organ. It's yeah, me too. such a cool <laughs> instrument, man. Yeah, and I'm very, I'm very lucky that I have someone like Kerry. You know, Kerry's a, you know, he's 25 years old and yeah. just ready to play, and he's very talented. And yeah, um, Patrick is a very talented guitar player, and you know, we just have a really great time right now. We're just playing. You know, we've been together less than a year, mm-hmm. and uh, I basically got very, very lucky to get a once a month gig at Mambo's Cafe in Burbank. Yeah, yeah. 
And, uh, you know, Ralph, the owner over there has been a good friend of mine since I moved to LA. And, mm-hmm. uh, when I told him I, what I was doing, he was like, Oh man, I have to have this in my club, <laughs> you know? And so it's been cool. It's been a great place for us to, to post up once a month. And, uh, I basically took a little bit of the jungle fire, um, perspective in that I curated a list of cover tunes mm-hmm. that I thought would really benefit the band uh education wise and then spark creativity to write new material yeah uh so we we have a list of uh 30 tunes Mm -hmm. that i'll switch and mix and match you know what i mean and uh and then you know now we're in the process we just we just did a show a couple weeks back and we're gonna take all of august off and and write for a 45 Nice. Uh, and you know, basically I'm, I'm running the same program that we run with jungle fire because it's the same folks that, that dig it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, so hopefully in the, you know, hopefully before the new year, I'll have a, I'll have a 45 out, um, and start the process of, of maybe putting a couple of those out and then put out an EP and, and uh, things along those lines. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's really cool how like in, in every aspect of, of your education and your career, that we've talked about so far, like at, at each stage, you didn't, you didn't worry too much about what you weren't doing. You no, know, you kind of stayed, you were, you were able to just focus on, on, you know, one or two things at a time and, and really devote yourself to those. And it's, it's one thing to be able to do that, but, but to, to not, especially in a town like LA, like you were talking about, to not be constantly looking around at all the people you don't know, all the scenes you're not a part of and, and all the shit you're not doing. Like that's a, that's a hard skill. It is. I mean, because you know, it's, it's a town that everybody wants to be a part of everything or wants to be a part of everything. And I chased that dream for a second. I Mm -hmm. chased it. Uh, but it, it doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I had a really great mentor in Carl Pedasso from the Timbali player from Santana, mm-hmm. right? When I first started playing in LA, I got to meet him and we became friends. And at a NAMM show, he just said something. I mean, it's perceived as dark, but it's been something that's really resonated with me is that, you know, not everybody's going to like you and not everybody's going to like your playing. Mm-hmm. And the sooner you get cool with that, the sooner life gets easier. Yeah. And when he said that, life did get easier mm. because I stopped worrying about chasing scenes that I didn't need to be a part of that I wasn't really – chasing gigs for money that I didn't really want to do Mm -hmm. and just chasing stuff around that I just wasn't interested in it. And again, that's, you know, leaving the smooth jazz scene. That was part of that, or, you know, not trying to do pop gigs anymore uh, because I didn't really dig it. You know, I wasn't really, I wasn't really into it. And, um, I started really doing things that I was into more songwriter stuff, more blues stuff, uh, taking the plunge in, in, in being in my forties and learning how to play jazz yeah, and, 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 and then, you know, starting my own band, starting mm-hmm. jungle fire with nine other guys. Everyone's like, what are you doing? That's suicide. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> or even, even when I started the orange tree, everybody was like, Oh man, you know, hauling an organ around, you know? And I, I just was like, I'm not really hearing that. Right. I'm hearing that I need to do what I need to do. Mm-hmm. And I need to just follow my path. And, and, you know, I'm lucky in LA that I, I have a good, support system. Mm -hmm. I have other drummers and that we hang out, we support each other. And cause it's a tough, it's a tough game to be in. Yeah. You know, being in the music business is tough. Um, you know, one of, one of, one of my good friends and and he's been on your show, Willie McNeil. Yeah. You know, Willie's been a, Willie's been a great supporter of mine and, and a good friend. And, you know, I mean, I've played a ton of, uh, burlesque gigs, because yeah. I'm the other, I'm the other bald guy with, the mustache, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, which has been, you know, incredible for me to try to sound like him, yeah. you know, I, 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 you know, I, I actually say Willie McNeil has the Elvin Jones falling downstairs thing down. Yeah. He has it down, man. Yeah. It's like, I don't know how the hell he's going to end some of the stuff he does, but he does. And it's so incredible. And like, I just love it. Uh, you know, and, and, and my, my North Texas brothers, Blair Sinta and Luke Adams, you know, we're out here on the grind doing it. And, mm-hmm. you know, um, uh, I got some good friends in, 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 uh, from the Cal Arts people, Cal Arts world I've met great drummer by the name of Chris Payne. And so we all hang and plus my, my unit of, of jungle fire, you know, yeah. Alberto, Steven and, and, and the guys there, you know, we all just really support each other. And, uh, I think you need that in this town. You know, yeah. it's, it's a, it's a town that, I'm born and raised here, right? So it's it's my town, but it's a very transitional place for people. 
yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, so it's hard to build lasting relationships because you're not really sure if anyone's going to stay. Right, right. You know, and, and I usually say it takes about three years to know if you're going to stay. Mm-hmm. Because the first year is all like glitz and glamour and shiny pennies. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. the second year you're like figuring out how you're going to make your rent. And, yeah, yeah. And, and, and if you're, if you're going to stay, are you going to be a renter for the rest of your life? Or are you going to try to, you know, take the plunge and buy a house? Yeah. And then the third year, you're just kind of over it all. And you're like, I just really want to be here because the weather's great. Right, right. You know, my wife, great. And I, my wife and I were talking to someone the other day about L.A. And, and she said the funniest thing. She was like, yeah, LA, L.A. seems real glamorous until you try to live your life. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> no, I mean, it's, you know, I, I, I stay here mainly because I love, I love the environment and mm-hmm. I love, uh, just the people that I'm involved making music with. Yeah. But, uh, you know, living here is tough. Yeah. It's just like living in New York was tough when, when I went there, it wasn't cheap. It was tough. Mm-hmm. And I think you just either get on with it or you don't. Yeah. You know, you'll figure out a way to make it work. People are like, how do you make it work? I just make it work. Yeah. You know, you just get you just get out there and you make it work, you and you don't. To. Yeah, you choose to make it work, and you don't sit at home and go, "Woe is me." Right. I, I think if you if you have that problem, you know, LA will eat you alive real mm-hmm. quick. Yeah, uh, and it does, and I see it happen all the time. I'll see really great musicians with really great hearts mm-hmm. get 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 their dreams just broken and run back to their small town where they came from. Right. You know, and and I'll, I'll a lot of times say, "Just stick it out, man. You'll become a better person if you stick it out." And, it, you know, don't don't let it toughen you up. Mm-hmm. Just just let it just just learn from your experiences and become better. Because right. you know? this town can make people super jaded, as you know. Oh, yeah. You know, you were here, mm-hmm. you know, and, and you even worked for the mouse. Oh, yeah. A lot of, a lot of jaded <laughs> people that work at the mouse. You Definitely. Know? And for those people that don't know what the mouse is, I'm talking about Disneyland. Yes. You know, yeah. so, you know, it's it, I just don't let it happen. And I just uh, I make it work. And, you know, I, I would be lying to you to say. There aren't tough days. There are days that are tough. There are mm-hmm. days that I question myself. There are days that I go like, wow, man, you know, I'm 45 years old and playing music and it's tough. Yeah. It's way tough now. It was way tougher. It's way tougher now than it was when I was 25. Right. You know, because in this town, you become, you expire on certain things. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You're, yep. you, you know, I don't have a, a head full of hair anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm. I'm still handsome, but in a different way. <laughs> it's a different you know? people. <laughs> it's a different people. Yeah. So you just go, you know, it's again, how do you make it work? How yeah. do you, how do you transition? And a lot of people have problems with that. They don't, they aren't able to have the foresight to go, all right, I can't do this anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, I need to kind of do something else. And, and, and like I said earlier, I'm studying jazz now because it's time. I'm ready. I have the patience to do it yeah. and, and, and I'll have the right, uh, mindset to go out and play it. You yeah. know what I mean? Just like I have the right mindset to do the organ trio or whatever I'm doing, you know, like or bring 10 people together for a rehearsal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. And I, I, I think, you know, I say this all the time with that band is, is we're very lucky and that band is really special. Mm-hmm. And I don't say it cause I'm in it. It is a special band yeah. to, to be able to hybridize all that music that we're doing and it be instrumental and, to have people come out and really enjoy it, mm-hmm. you know what I mean, and and not a bunch of music dudes, yeah, you know, like like normal folks, you know, women come and dance, right. you know what I mean, like we make people dance, yeah. we make women dance, you know mm-hmm. what I mean, and uh, you know, my dad always used to say like, hey man, for every two girls in the audience, there's about twenty dumb guys that follow, you know, <laughs> <That's great. laughs> uh, um, part of I think why I play dance music is you know my parents Mm -hmm. my dad liked music that grooved you know he was more of a big band jazz guy Mm -hmm. uh which and more dance jazz i call it dance jazz yeah because you know and and then uh and rockabilly he liked all those things that were coming out of jazz right you know my mom was a complete opposite more of a funk Hmm. earth wind and fire Mm -hmm. um type of thing my parents were 14 years apart so you know, different perspectives. And, and my mom also liked a lot of great songwriters mm-hmm. and country songwriters, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it was a very interesting musical perspective in my house. And I think it's, you know, I didn't know it was shaping me, but it shaped me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I didn't, I, 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 you know, I didn't, no one forced me to play the drums. It just happened one day. Mm-hmm. I don't know why it happened. It just happened. <laughs> I just told my mom, Hey, I want to play the drums. You know, mm-hmm. I was like 10. 
I just wanted to play the drums. Right. So, right. Probably just all the rhythm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I got, I spent five years in LA and, and I, I, I left before I got really jaded and dark on it. And, and before I sort of expired, uh, in, in a few things like you were talking about, but man, my, my hat is off to, to guys like you who are in it for the long haul and, and doing it with, with positivity and doing it on your terms. And it's, it's a, it's a beautiful thing to see, man. Well, there are a lot of us out here doing it. You know what I mean? I, I think I'm not the only one. I think the reason why I am is because there's guys older than me that have kind of led the way, yeah, you know? Yeah. I'll, I'll, I mean, I'll give him a huge shout out. Butch Norton. He's been a big help, you know? Mm-hmm. Butch is a great drummer who plays with Lucinda Williams mm-hmm. and, and does his own thing. Right. Blazes his own path. Right. Jay Bellrose, another one, blazes his own path. And, uh, you know, for your listeners who are listening to this, if you don't know who Jay Bellrose is or Butch Norton, get hip. Yeah. Those yeah. are some really great songwriter drummers and and beyond. And and Willie, man, talk about a dude who gives yeah. everybody the double bird and says, "I'm doing what I want." Uh, big time, <laughs> big big time. I mean, you know, man, he just put together a band he hasn't played with in 15 years and sold out the Roxy. Man, you know, <laughs> like I, I mean, you know, and and you know, the cat's 54 years old and yeah. doing it yeah, and yeah. doing it, and and you know, he's always done it. Mm-hmm. You know, and and I think that's what I always just tell young people: you just got to get out there and do it. Yeah. Uh, there'll be tough times. I, 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 you know, another, I quote my dad a lot, but you know, he said if, if, uh, music was easy, everybody would do it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great life. Yeah. You know, I get up, I go practice drums, I go play drums, I go home and go to bed. It's never boring. It's never boring. Yeah. You know, and there's always a new challenge every day. I sit behind the drums or I sit on a bandstand that I'm not familiar with folks. And, mm-hmm. uh, I, you know, I feel I feel very lucky, and I've been in the right place in the right time at a lot of points in my career. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think that's that's helped, and uh, and I say that to people: if you want to make music, go where the music is. Yeah, go where the music is. If it's New York for you, if it's if it's where you're at in Atlanta, mm-hmm. or if it's where I'm at in Los Angeles, or San Francisco, or Chicago, or or Austin, Texas. Yep. Go where the music's at. Yep. You'll find your tribe. You'll find the people that want to make music with you, and and you will be successful. You know, it just yeah. takes time. Awesome. We'll keep doing it, man. We'll be watching. Thanks, bud. Thanks so much for talking. Thanks for having me. There you go. Michael Duffy. Big thanks to him for taking the time with us. Leave us a rating and review on iTunes, if you please. Uh, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And post your pics and videos using the hashtag Working Drummer. We love seeing what all you are up to out there. We've seen some beautiful kits, big and small. We've seen some amazing rooms and outdoor spaces where you guys are playing. Uh, We've seen the great bands you guys are playing with. It's all really cool, so keep them coming. Thanks to Mike Jackson for his technical assistance. Thanks to Sakai Drums. Check out their website and pester your local drum shop to start carrying them if they aren't already. And thanks, as always, for listening. Cheers. Cheers.